What's good, neighborhood? We're doing something a little different this time. Well, more than a little, as this marks the official relaunch of the backlog. When I started doing these reviews, much like with the Twitch channel, the goal was simply to share my love of classic gaming with an audience and to channel that into writing game reviews. Why review games that are decades old, you ask? To show appreciation for where we've been as it relates to where we are now in terms of the gaming hobby and industry. Why relaunch the backlog? Because it needs a refresh that I can more consistently maintain. With this relaunch of the backlog, there's going to be a focus on quality. So instead of attempting weekly reviews, this will be a monthly, online publication, as it were. Not only will there be a selection of retro game reviews covering titles from the NES all the way to late PS2, early PS3, but I also plan to include segments like interviews, the community spotlight, and even showcasing viewer feedback via fan art or comments on social media. As this counts as the first issue of the backlog, it's only fitting that I cover the games that got me started on the path to being the gamer I am today. You'll find the timestamp table of contents below. If you see a review or section that grabs you, then feel free to click over and check it out. Otherwise, if you're watching all the way through, I hope you enjoy the new format. With that said, it's time to press start. Super Mario Bros. took 1985 by storm in a way that I'm sure not even the folks at Nintendo were expecting. It's a simple premise both in lore and in mechanics. It runs from left to right, jump on enemies, pick up power-ups, and defeat Bowser to rescue Princess Toadstool and save the Mushroom Kingdom. Pretty straightforward, right? Bruh. But what makes this even more of a humble beginnings kind of title is that the developers mapped out the game using graph paper. It's just like how old school dungeon masters mapped out their D&D campaigns. Yet, underneath the surface of this seminal title were lessons that many of us gamers have carried with us ever since. A gaming masterclass, Super Mario Bros. held within its pixels lessons about navigating unfamiliar terrain, pattern recognition, and persistence in the face of uncertain challenges. The original game was simple and uncomplicated visually, but established a color palette that would be easy to navigate no matter the size or color settings of your television. The tunes composed for and used in this game have become iconic household melodies. If one were to walk down the street and hear those telltale notes, you could bet that the folks inside were having a great time guiding those unassuming plumbers on their unusual quest. Mechanically, since the NES had a simple controller featuring two face buttons, A and B, two system buttons, start and select, and a four-directional D-pad, Super Mario Bros. was concise. Run and jump, with a few secret areas that could catapult you to further points in the game. Even for a game so simplistic, families the world over, mine included, spent hours upon hours enjoying the music and unlocking the deceptive death of this graph paper born legend. It could easily be said that Nintendo saved gaming, and the charge was led by two plumbers looking to rescue a princess. Some of my earliest gaming memories were right in front of the TV playing this exact game. Frankly, I wouldn't have it any other way. While the home console market was emerging from its E.T.-induced chrysalis of crisis, the amusement center and arcade scene was still going strong. In 1987, Yoshihisa Kishimoto and the team at Technos Japan had introduced the gaming industry to their own pair of heroic brothers. However, the battle waged by Billy and Jimmy Lee was one that took place in a more familiar setting. The premise of Double Dragon was not unlike Mario, though. Your girlfriend was attacked and abducted. And as one of the intrepid masters of the martial arts so sets Ken, it's up to you, the player, to get her back. Visually, this quarter-consuming tour de force was a stark contrast to Mario, as the characters were considerably more defined than the jaggy 8-bit pixels found in the NES Classic. 
instead of throwing fireballs, fists, feet, and trash cans were flying at a rapid pace instead. The colors, while still vibrant in order to attract players, were of a darker palette, as instead of animated plants, players were dealing with muscle-bound goons, brick, and asphalt. The sounds of the game were also indicative of the bone-crunching hits being treated on screen in arcades all over, and the tunes therein leaned more toward the synth-rock atmosphere of 80s action cinema. Much like its premise, the controls for Double Dragon were a simple affair. Eight directional movement on the joystick and three action buttons, punch, kick, and jump, made for direct, accurate, and generally responsive activity, despite the game's difficulty being designed to inhale the contents of a player's coin pouch. Since the NES was lighting up homes from Fresno to Fort Lauderdale, it was inevitable that Double Dragon would come to a TV near you. With one less action button on the NES gamepad, though, some changes were made in order to keep the action as arcade accurate as possible. Double Dragon could rightly be chalked up as Ace's first beat up. My brothers and I spent countless hours and a near equivalent amount of quarters brawling our way through the Shadow Warriors to rescue Marion from their clutches. I had a blast every time I loaded up the game, and I can say that without this game, I wouldn't have the love of action games that I do today. So to you, Billy and Jimmy Lee, a tip of the old baseball cap. It's been said that fighting games are just glorified beat-em-ups in boss rush format. And if we're being honest, that assessment isn't too far off the mark. Instead of one versus many gauntlets leading to an action-packed set piece, fighting games just pit you against your main opponent right from the jump. Even though there were head-to-head -head fighters already on the market, like Karate Champ, or even the prequel to our current subject, it was the 1989 release of Street Fighter II that truly started the fighting game boom that would continue on into the present. Over the two years since its release, Street Fighter II would continue to refine its engaging sprites and iconic color palette on the CPS-1 and CPS-2 arcade boards. With expertly crafted character designs and music, Street Fighter II and its revisions would go on to define a generation of gaming and change the global pop culture zeitgeist forever. Numerous competitors and imitators would come onto the scene and eventually form a whole new genre of gaming. But the audiovisual benchmark remains to this day Street Fighter II. Where Double Dragon went for accuracy of gameplay through simplicity, Street Fighter was a bit more in-depth. With the six action buttons assigned to the different levels of punches and kicks that the characters on screen could perform, Street Fighter 2 was all about giving the players the utmost control over their chosen character. In each animation, each move, the character's personalities were clear for all to see, and made choosing one of the original 17 truly memorable. Needless to say, I grew up alongside Street Fighter. This was the game that got me into the FGC, but it also sparked my interest in martial arts. This led to me meeting some of my closest lifelong friends, and even helped me mature as an individual. The losses I've taken in Street Fighter have helped me improve to the level where I can say I'm a pretty competent player, and above all, a more capable person. Street Fighter has, without exaggeration, laid the foundation of who I am today. Blast processing was one of the earliest gaming memes I can remember from my childhood. When Sonic the Hedgehog came out the gate swinging alongside the Sega Genesis, the game was completely changed. While the Master System was out on the market and offered a great alternative to the NES, between that, the Game Boy, and the more recently released Super NES, Nintendo had the home console market all but cornered. But not anymore. 
The sound font employed on the Sega Genesis was a stark contrast to its competitor, and Sonic took great advantage of it, bringing a totally unique sound to its catchy, kinetic sound cues and stage themes. Even when stages can seemingly pass by in a flash, you still have enough time to be drawn in by the music, and also by the genuinely lively colors and settings. From granite labyrinths to festive casinos, Sonic offers a staggeringly diverse and beautiful slate of settings to blast through at breakneck speeds. Then, we have the controls. Between the three face buttons, A, B, and C, the two system buttons being start and select, and the D-pad, the simple mechanics of Sonic the Hedgehog paved the way for players to focus on what the game was built for. Speed. You run, you jump, avoid spikes, and smash Robotnik's machines to rescue your animal buddies. The pace at which this game moves was truly revolutionary, and the fact that it still stayed buttery smooth throughout brought it to a whole new level. Sonic the Hedgehog truly opened my eyes to gaming beyond Nintendo, and made me recognize Sega as a powerhouse in the console market back in the 90s. While it's sad that Sega no longer makes consoles, I don't think my childhood in gaming would be complete without Sonic. The speed, the freedom of exploration, and the wild mechanics introduced in later games all worked together to set the blue blur apart from the competition. I count myself lucky that Sonic was giving Mario a run for his money, because in the end, no matter who won the console war, gamers like myself came out all the better for it. take just a quick moment to thank my two current patrons and everyone else that's coming in to take a listen and check out the new format of the backlog. There's been some hardship in trying to put this together, which I don't want to swamp you with the details of. However, I do want to say that we've got bigger and better things coming in future months, and in fact, for those that are on the Patreon, you'll get to see some footage of something that I was attempting to do for this first issue, but due to my own ineptitude at the time and certain circumstances afterward, wasn't able to include in the issue. But I will be doing so, and I will make the announcement of what I plan to include as of February's issue of The Backlog. Until then, stay happy, stay gaming, and stay good, neighborhood. We'll see you next time.